Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a huge thank you uh, to everyone who's taken the time to be a part of this day. And my thanks also to Telefonica and Eleven Paths for the opportunity to get to speak with you, and also for the partnership with Blue Coat and Symantec. Uh, so I want to spend a little bit today talking about w what I think is the, the theme of this overall event and it's innovation in security. What is happening in the security space from an innovation perspective? What can we expect to see on the horizon? What, we, what might we as security professionals want to or try to push in the security space going forward? And you know, people tend to think about security as a very static discipline. What I, I hope you've seen from the innovations that Telefonica has shown today, that security is a very vibrant and alive discipline. A lot of innovation is happening in this space. And then I'm gonna spend a little bit talking about a, a concept that I think we all know very well, the concept of defense in depth. Right? Defense in depth, we've all seen the pictures with the castle and the moat and you know, why you have to diversify layers of security. But I think that in the world of cloud, in the world of services, it's not that defense in depth is being outdated, I think it is being augmented. So I want to talk to you about a proposal for a couple additional properties to add to defense in depth. Uh, before I get there, I just wanted to share with you a personal security story to, to start, uh, start the afternoon and give you a little bit of context. So I travel uh, quite a bit. I've been in the security space for a long time. Um, sometimes I feel like the travel is a denial of life attack. I think last year I flew 500,000 real miles, right, which is not, uh, not recommended, never a good idea. Uh, and maybe three years ago, I moved my family over to Singapore. And we spent six months in Singapore, at least in theory we spent six months in Singapore. I spent most of my time on an airplane, but my family spent six months there. And afterwards, you know, my wife was so disheartened because I was flying around all the time. We had two young kids. She made a proclamation that before we moved back to the U.S., we will go on a vacation, and she will pick the vacation destination. And I had no say in the matter, and she would pick the place. And I said, absolutely, definitely, that's the least I could do is kind of let you pick this place. And she decided on Bali in Indonesia. Just out of curiosity, how many people here have been to Bali? A couple of people, a few people in the back. Um, so, Amazing place on paper, right? If you, if you kind of look at it, some very, very interesting things there. And as soon as she mentioned that's where she wanted to go, uh, I went to the definitive source on Bali, which I think is Wikipedia, and I went to the Bali entry, and I, I found uh, a mention of a place that's there called the Monkey Forest. Uh, very, very interesting, at least again in the Wikipedia description, was very interesting. And it talked about tens of thousands of wild monkeys that lived in this forest. And my children were very young, and we would watch a cartoon on TV called Curious George. I'm not sure if you get that over here, uh, but a very you know, animated, happy monkey that goes around and does mischievous things. So I was very excited about seeing these monkeys. I thought I'd take a picture with a monkey, you know, somehow bond with those monkeys. Uh, and so we get to this monkey forest finally on our trip to Bali. And I just want to show you uh, what the entrance looks like. And it it's actually looks kind of scary. If you look at the monkeys, both on the left and the right, they don't look very happy. In fact, they look mean and you know, a little aggressive, but I thought this is just for tourists. There's kind of a very scary symbol on the top. Again, you know, I just dismissed it as uh, this is a, a tourist thing. And so we walked up 
to the front of this forest and immediately were greeted by a banana seller. And it was me, my wife, and my brother-in-law that had uh, come down to visit and join us on this vacation. And my children were thankfully at the hotel uh, with my wife's mother. So it was the three of us. And I bought a bushel of bananas for myself, a bushel for my wife, and a, a, a bushel for my brother-in-law. Brother and then we walked into this forest and immediately were greeted by five large monkeys. And very exciting, you know, I peel off a banana, throw it to a monkey, the monkey peels the banana, eats it. I'm like, this is amazing. You know, it feels like I'm in a National Geographic magazine. <laughs> And my brother-in-law does the same thing. He peels off a banana, throws it to a monkey. The monkey unwraps it, eats it. I'm like, this is great. But then something very strange happened. And even to this day, I can't figure out why it happened. But my wife was incredibly reluctant to give a banana to any of these monkeys. And you could see tension starting to build among the monkeys. So they were looking at each other, they were looking at us, they were looking at each other. I'm looking at my wife, and I you know, just can't figure out why she wouldn't give them a banana, which was a subject of much discussion later, as you'll, you'll find out soon. Um, and so finally, after maybe 30 seconds of this, the monkeys attack. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a victim uh, of a monkey attack, but it, it's definitely something that you would remember. So these five large monkeys come after us, and now my wife is taking her bananas, weaponizing them, stepping back, throwing them, and then finally throws the, the whole bushel, and the monkeys descend on it. And it distracts them long enough for us to run away, unfortunately. Uh, we ran deeper into the monkey forest, and I, I want to share with you one uh, family vacation photo shortly after this, uh, this monkey attack. So this is uh, me on the left, uh, obviously. It's my brother-in-law on the right. Uh, my wife is taking the photo so you don't see her. Uh, but I'd like for you to draw your attention to the belly button area of both myself and my brother-in-law. And what we decided to do, which we thought was brilliant at the time, is to take the bananas that we had left and hide them in our shirts by folding the shirt over, thinking that the monkeys would never you know, look there or imagine. And apparently this is monkey 101. This is like you know, what tourists always do. And I, I also would like to draw your attention to that medium-sized monkey on the right-hand side of the screen. About 30 seconds after this photo was taken, that monkey called across maybe six or seven of his friends, and those guys just ripped us apart. I mean, ripped our shirts apart, took the bananas, I had a pack of crackers in my pocket. They took the pack of crackers. And so now we're you know, completely disoriented, no food, nothing of value to a monkey. And, and unfortunately, again, we ran you know, even deeper into this, into this monkey forest. Uh, and at the back, if you've ever been there, is a really beautiful temple, actually. So we walk up to this temple. And there's a wall with the very, very tiny monkeys just kind of hanging out on the wall. And so my wife had recovered from her previous monkey incident. And you know, I'm like, we, we've got no food left. So we walk up to the monkeys, hoping to kind of maybe interact with them in some way. And within a few seconds of being there, one of those small monkeys jumps on my wife's head steals this, this thing, I think it's called a scrungy that holds her hair together, and then stands on the wall with it and starts dancing <laughs> left to right. And I'm like, what's going on? And so then I look further down the wall, and there's another tiny monkey, and it's got some guy's glasses, and it's doing the same thing, right? It's just kind of moving. And so then a banana seller approaches us from behind. 
And he explains that these are the extortionist monkeys. So they're too small to survive in those first waves of monkeys that attack the tourists. And because they're very tiny, they've had to become more innovative over time. So you can think about them almost as ransomware monkeys, right? And he explained, he explained to us that they would actually negotiate with you for your items. And so conveniently, he had bananas to sell. So we, we bought some, some more bananas. There's a conspiracy theory I have about that, but we can go into that uh, later. Uh, and you know, I think I, we offer him one banana, you know, monkey says no, and then I think, I think it was a four banana transaction to get, the, to get the scrunchie back. But unfortunately, the guy with the glasses, was, it was terrible. I mean, I think it was like three bushels or something. So the monkey knew he had something of value. After this, we secured every item that we had on us, and we just sat on the side, and we watched these monkeys for maybe like an hour. And what was really interesting about it is that they, they knew who to go after. They knew who would pay their ransom. It was incredible. There were some people, people with glasses, people with scrunchie, they would just leave them alone. They, they, they wouldn't approach them, they would look nice and kind of smile for the picture. And then there's other people that you could tell they were planning their attack. Very interesting. And you know, some people may look at that and say it's instinct. It's, you know, may, may, maybe some, some innate thing that the monkey has, you know, developed to be able to understand this. I think it really is a big data analytics issue. So, so they have watched hundreds thousands of tourists, and somehow they have identified, I don't know, indicators of extortion or, you know, IOEs, I don't, you know, I don't know how to, how, how to describe it, but qualities of a person that leads them to believe that this person will be a willing or a compelling or at least a compliant victim. I, I, I bring that up because it is amazing when you see that type of thing in nature. Data that gets processed over a long period of time that gets transformed into behavior. I think we are at a very, very exciting time in the security space right now. We're at a time where we're moving from an era of security based on precedent, doing what we're doing now because somebody else did it a year ago, and then a year before that, and a year before that, to security that's truly being guided by metrics and data. And very, very exciting to be a part of security at that time. But I think that there are some important decisions that we have to make to get us through that transition. And I want to talk to you about some of those opportunities that exist. You know, it, it has never been a better time, not just to be in security, but to be in technology in, in general. I mean, could you imagine that, that you could have chosen a better career than this? And think about how IT is transforming and disrupting normal parts of life. Now, for probably 50 years, this is the way that you got a taxi or you got a ride. It's certainly how you did it in New York City. Today, for millions of people, this is how you get a ride. Incredibly disruptive in a very short period of time. For probably 150 years, this is what it meant to go to a bank. Right? You show up at a physical building, you talk to someone, you engage with them. Today, uh, a bank for most people is a mobile phone. I don't think I've gone in, and I'm not antisocial or anything, but I don't think I've gone in and talked to a bank teller in probably a year. If you visit the Telefonica Innovation Center, you will see what the digital bank has truly evolved into. It's pretty incredible. But you also see technology driving uh, uh, amazing achievements, things that we thought were impossible. You know, one of my favorite examples of this uh, is an experiment, a website that, that was up for a while. It's not as actively used now, but it's a game called Fold.it. I don't know if anybody's gone there, Fold It. 
And it's, it's an online game. It's very addictive, so warning. You know, it might be a denial of weekend attack or something if you go there and get hooked on it. Uh, but it's a game where you fold proteins. And you know, pretty interesting game. It's got some very obscure rules to it. But as you are playing this game, it just so happens that the rules of the game correspond to the rules of biology and genetics. And when you're spending your cycles, your innovation, your time in playing the game, you're actually helping to solve very complex problems in areas like virology, for example. And they've published a ton of academic papers out of the work that's come from people playing these games and the insight that's come from it. I just want to read you. Uh, one quote that came from a peer-reviewed journal that was based on this data, it says, we challenged players of the protein folding game Fold It to produce accurate models of the protein, and the refined structure provides new insights for the design of antiretroviral drugs. This was an incredible and popular site at the time when uh, Ebola was in the news constantly. Uh, an incredible amount of progress has been made through the work that people have done here. Now, I bring this up because think about the IT infrastructure you would need to stand this up today. All you need is an Amazon account or an Azure account and a dream. Right? You, you can rent the compute. You just need innovation behind it. So we're in this time of transformation where lots of things are getting disintermediated or getting disrupted. But the way that we do IT is getting disrupted at exactly the same time. And so I want to talk to you about some of those transitions and about how the way that we protect has to evolve in, in tandem with these transitions. In, in fact, I think if we do a good job on the security piece, we can actually accelerate some of these transitions. So this is a traditional perimeter security model of standard IT, right? You could probably pull this out of any textbook five years ago. Uh, I was a, a, a lecturer at um, Columbia University for about five years and you know, probably showed 30 pictures that look something like this. And the standard setup was you've got a headquarters or maybe multiple headquarters. You've got some data centers. You've got some regional branch offices. They've got MPLS connections uh, back into the head office. And then you break out to the internet, and there's a security stack sitting between you and the internet. And it would include all the normal stuff, a firewall, a secure web gateway, IDS, maybe IPS. This was the standard model that many people worked off of for a long time. And back, back in that model, one of the key things that we would rely upon is this idea of defense in depth. Now, defense in depth is, is very old as an idea. It, it predates technology, right? Thousands and thousands of years old. It's true. And, it, and the principles make sense whether you're trying to protect a castle or you're trying to protect uh, an enterprise or protect IT. And I just want to review some of the basic principles here and then talk about how I think these principles aren't changing but are getting augmented. So in classic defense in depth, we know that we have to have three things. One is multiple layers of defense, right? We need multiple layers. And, People always talk about a castle when they talk about defense in depth, so I will talk about a castle. I promised myself I wouldn't show a picture of a castle, because I'm sure you guys have seen it a thousand times. Um, but think about the idea of having a tall wall and then having a moat, maybe with a dragon in it, I don't know, for example, uh, in between an attacker or a grasser and the people that are inside those castle walls. You need, first of all, to have consistency of the application. So you have to have the wall all the way around the castle and the moat all the way around the castle, not just around the front. And then the third property is you need diversity of those layers. So assuming somebody who is great at scaling big castle walls may not be so great at swimming a moat, for example. 
So we want diversity of layers, we want application consistency, uh, and we want multiple layers. These are the fundamental principles of defense in depth. Now let's talk about how IT is changing, and then I'll talk about how defense in depth is getting augmented. So this is the classic um, model still of IT, but what's happened really over the last seven or eight years is the user has left the building, right? That's already happened. There's nothing we can do about it. People are doing more work from a Starbucks, a coffee shop, an airport than they are doing uh, from inside of the office. We all know that, but that's incredibly disruptive to this prior model. The other thing that we've seen is that the applications have left the building. So what once were racks and racks and racks and racks of servers that had a whole bunch of internal applications are now moving out to implementations that are in Salesforce or on force.com, or we're moving and using things like Workday and ServiceNow and Office 365. We also have the infrastructure moving outside of the building. Now, all of this is putting incredible pressure on the bandwidth going from the company, the people that are still working in the office, and those applications. But the other big change that's happened is the rise in SSL encryption. It's, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's amazing to see because it's one of those few security advances where it hasn't really affected the user negatively. Almost always when you add security, it adds some level of pain to the user. But my mom has no idea that this transition has happened. And it hasn't negatively impacted her. In fact, from a security perspective and a privacy perspective, it's positively impacted her. But think about what that has done to the visibility we have on the network and those controls, that security stack, that now have to work on data that is flowing through HTTPS in most cases. So we've got to deal with that. Another thing that's happened is that the branch office wants to go direct to net for a whole bunch of reasons. Cost probably being the biggest one and just convenience of the user performance. And then another big change that's happening that I, I think we're still trying to deal with and understand exactly what it means is all of these connected devices that are using sensitive data that now are going direct to the internet. So these are the changes that we're faced with. So what does defense in depth mean in a world where it's very hard to define what the thing is that you're defending? It's easy to say, I'm defending the user, I'm defending the data. It's very easy to say that in a conversation. It's very difficult to apply defense in depth as a model to those things. So I want to propose a couple of additions to defense in depth. One is, I think we have to build an architecture in security that really is pluggable. An architecture that allows for the fact that we may want to add new security controls in the future. So, so something that really is modular, future-proof, and can take advantage of the innovation that will come in the security space. And we don't know where it'll come from. It could come from big security companies. It could come from tiny security companies. It could come from startups. It could come from PhD students. It could come from your cousin. There's a lot of different places it could come from. We need to be set up to be able to ingest this. And you know, to, to discuss this, I, I want to share a, a second uh, personal story with you. Uh, this one happened uh, about two years ago uh, at RSA Conference. So how many people here have been to RSA Conference, just out of curiosity? OK, OK, some people. If you haven't been, I encourage you to go. Not just because I'm the program chair and I have to say that and all of that. It really is fantastic. So this past year we had 40,000 people 
Uh, really, really great to see that kind of growth in the space. Lots of security professionals. Next year, it'll probably be 50,000 people there, um, all folks focused on, uh, on security. Uh, but it is a very stressful week for me personally, right? Because there's a lot going on, a lot of strange things happen behind the scenes, um, and you have to monitor all of those things. And so two years ago, so not this past conference in 2016, uh, the one in 2015, it had just been a crazy first two days of the conference. I won't go into the details. If I see it uh, kind of reception afterwards, maybe I'll, uh, I'll share some with you. Uh, but just suffice it to say, it's been a very stressful Monday and Tuesday. So Wednesday morning, I got up at 6 o'clock. I had a breakfast meeting at 7 was dressed, ready to go. I was on the phone with my wife at 6.45, you know, I had my headset on, went down the elevator at the W Hotel, and as soon as I walked outside, got a massive nosebleed. Now, I, I, I don't know how many people here have had nosebleeds before, but this is the first time I had ever had one ever in my whole life. And if you've never had a nosebleed, it is really traumatic when you have the first one. I mean, think of the concept of hemorrhaging from your nose, right, and not knowing kind of what's going on. So I'm outside of this hotel, I'm pinching my nose, you know, there's people all around, you know, are you okay, everything's going on, I think so, everything's fine, everything's fine. And I, I run back into the elevator, you know, I get up to my room, and I call the people that I'm about to have breakfast with. So one of them was a, a colleague, another was a partner, and, and I'm on the phone with, um, with my colleague uh, who's there uh, at the breakfast table. And I'm like, look, you know, I'm really sorry. I can't make it for breakfast. I got this nosebleed. And immediately she starts giving medical advice, right? And so she tells me, you've got to pinch it, right? And I'm like, obviously I am pinching it, you know, that's why, I, and then uh, she's like, no, lean your head forward and pinch it as hard as you can. Pinch it until you lose feeling in your fingers, right? And I'm like, wow, you know, that sounds a little extreme, but you know, thanks, you know, th th thanks very much for the advice. And then I hear a scuffle in the back, almost like a fight breaking out. And the person who was from the partner that, that we were going to have breakfast with pulls the phone away, puts it on speaker in the middle of this uh, big restaurant, and he says, don't do that. Like, go to the bathroom right now, stuff both nostrils with tissue paper, and lean your head back immediately. All right? And I'm like, wow, thanks, guys. You know, really appreciate this. And then, then you know, kind of hung up. And I'm thinking, wow, these are completely opposing pieces of advice, right? And I don't remember either of these people having any kind of medical training. And so I'm like, this is a medical issue. I can't mess around here. And so immediately, I got on my laptop, and I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> Now, if you've never read uh, the nosebleed entry for, uh, you know, in, in Wikipedia, it's actually very compact. It's very long, so I'll, I'll summarize it. Basically, what it says is, you're probably okay, but you might be dying. <laughs> right? that's, a, that's a summary. It's a loose, loose summary, loose summary of what it says, right? And so, like, you know, very concerned by that last part of it, um, I'm like, okay, I can't mess around here. Uh, I, I really need, need some kind of medical advice. And I remember that we had started to adopt our, our company as part of our health insurance, had this application called Teladoc. I'm sure you have something equivalent uh, over here. Very interesting. So it is a remote medicine application, right? So it's, uh, and I remembered I had the, the card saved in my, in my digital wallet, so that's my Teladoc card. And you download the application, there's the, the Teladoc app in the you know, top, top left corner there, and it will give you a real-time, you know, fa face, FaceTime chat session with a doctor. And I'm like, wow, this is great. So I open it up, I'm like, I need to see somebody immediately, and I'm like, okay, a doctor will contact you within the next 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, this is great. 
So while I'm waiting for this, I'm online, you know, I'm looking at Yahoo Health forums and things like this, very, very bad idea. Uh, Electric Panda underscore 82 had some interesting advice. And then, and then she said something like, if, it's, if your blood pressure is high, that could be one of those signs that it's something really bad. So then I start browsing around uh, in, in the iStore, in the Apple uh, iStore, and it'd be very interesting to run this app through some of that technology you guys were showing earlier, by the way. Uh, and I find a blood pressure app. Has anybody ever used this thing? It's, it's actually fascinating. So, you know, I download this blood pressure app, and it, look, it actually looks incredibly embarrassing. I mean, you never want to do it in public. But, but the way that it works is you put your finger on the camera, and it shines a light through, uh, through your finger, and then you put the microphone up to your heart. And uh, you know, so, somehow between those two things, it, it gives you a reading uh, of your blood pressure. So I did it, and I paid $4.99 for it, right, which I was willing to do in those circumstances. Uh, and it told me my blood pressure was high, which, uh, which also, you know, not a good sign. So finally, the doctor calls, uh, and, you know, a very embarrassing session of positioning the camera kind of up the, the nasal cavity and that kind of stuff. And, and finally, he comes back, and he's like, look, you know, just, just, um, you know, just, just keep stuffing it, and, you know, I think you're fine. I think you'll be okay. And I'm like, okay, fine. And, and that was the end of that call. Now, what was interesting about that to me on reflection is I never imagined when I bought that iPhone that someday, sometime, it would turn first into a medical diagnostic portal, right, into something that I could use to actually connect with my doctor. I never imagined it could do things for me like tell my blood pressure I never imagined when I bought it the richness of the app ecosystem that could be built around it. And it's interesting when you think about an iPhone or an Android, really they're just very, very rich sensors. They have incredible sensory capability. And what they've done, the thing that's made it so interesting, isn't the apps that are published by the manufacturer, because there's very few. It's the innovation of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that take those sensors and use them in very innovative ways. When I make a bet on buying the next iPhone, and I did, by the way, I bought the, the iPhone uh, um, 7, when I made a bet on buying that phone, I'm actually making a bet on the entire innovation ecosystem of all the developers that are writing apps for that phone. I think that's how we need to start thinking about security. Whenever we add a new security control, whenever we add something in the security fabric, I think we need to ask the question, are we just adding this one-off piece of security technology, or are we laying a foundation that will also allow us to tap into future innovation that may come in this space. It's a very different way of thinking about security and thinking about defense in depth. The next new requirement is the ability to insert control and analytics into the flow between a user and a resource that the user is trying to access. You know, today, the model looks very much like this, right? You have a user, you know what device they're gonna use. They could be using some IoT thing, they could be using a watch to access Salesforce, they could be using a laptop, they could be using a BYOD tablet, they could be using a managed device. But at the end of the day, it's a user accessing some resource that more and more commonly sits in the cloud. If you think about what has to happen during that process for security, for governance, for control, for protection, we need a way to help that user make good choices. Most security comes down to people making bad choices. 
That, that's what security comes down to at the end of the day. Most of these APTs that we actually have details on and we can see what actually happened and how they originally, the attackers, got into that company, it wasn't because of some crazy, you know, ninja, prodigy person that lives in his mom's basement and, you know, just spends his time, like, looking at dragons that go across screens and finding zero days and stuff. It's, it's, it's mostly people who try and trick a user into opening an attachment, clicking a link, it's trying to trick a user into making a mistake. So most security comes down to people making mistakes. So most security protection should come down to helping users make better choices and augmenting their ability to make those good choices. And don't even provide them a choice when we know that the choice is dangerous. And it requires what I think is a concept that's an also an old one. Don't, don't think about network proxy when I say proxy, but think about the base idea of a proxy. Think about proxy in the real world, in your everyday life. When do we use proxies? A lawyer is often a proxy. A lawyer is someone who has specialized knowledge that's there to augment your intent and add legal expertise into that mix to help you fulfill your intent. A doctor is a proxy. When you're sedated under anesthesia, undergoing surgery, the doctor is making decisions on your behalf but trying to carry out your intent, but augmenting that intent with a bunch of additional knowledge. I think we need to think more broadly about the concept of inserting something in between the user and the thing that the user is trying to access. Now, where could this proxy be? It doesn't have to be on the network. It could be on the network. It could be in the cloud. It could be at the endpoint. But it should be somewhere, because if we have a spot in between, we can provide constantly refined, constantly updated analytics. So going back to the monkeys and the analytics, it's very interesting when you have a foothold, a termination point that you can add analytics into that can be changed in the future. So I think we need to think about that because what's happening is we're losing our ability to understand signals of danger online. So I used to live in New York City. Uh, I'm sure several of you have been to New York. Uh, New York general is a very safe place, but there's still some uh, dangerous neighborhoods. And my family's all from the Bahamas. And so my, uh, my mom, when she would come and visit, we'd walk around, and we instantly knew if we wandered into a bad neighborhood. Like, we didn't have to tell each other and say, hey, mom, you realize this is a bad neighborhood, right? And mom's like, we've got to get out of here. None of that went down. We would all know the signals of danger, right? It kind of looked like this. You start running into buildings that have bars on them. There's graffiti, a couple of bullet holes, maybe a trash can on fire. You know you're not in a good place. Right? But we've learned these signals over time as we've grown up. We all know them. But online, figuring out signals of danger with technology, that's way hard, and it's getting harder. So for me, when I'm on the web, I'm very paranoid. I'm sure most people, given the calling and given you're in this room, are paranoid too. And if I go to a website that is www, I really want to steal everything you have, dot ru, like, this is probably not a good site. Even though they've got a great deal on this PlayStation 4, I should not take this deal. Right? That's, you know, that's a signal of danger. For my mom, that website is the same as Amazon.com. Right? They got a better price on something, she's going to buy it from there. 
So there are a lot of people that aren't equipped to understand and map those signals. But honestly, even those of us that are pretty paranoid, the signals are being taken away from us. Is this a safe link to click on or not? You don't know. You can't, you have no way of telling what's on the other side of this. By the way, please visit it. It's a link to uh, my most recent book. That's shameless, shameless plug for the book. Um, but I bring this up because if we get this thing on a mobile phone, we don't know where we're going to go. That is why we need a set of assistive technology behind us, a set of analytics that are going to go out, check that thing, and then make the decision on whether we can go there or not, even if we click it. The third new component is to develop a competency in failure. We need to understand how to fail well. There's been enough massive security breaches, big incidents, for us to know that even very, very sophisticated companies can be compromised with the right attacker that has the right intent. So we have to build a competency in failure which means that we have to have an infrastructure in place to recover quickly if something happens, but also quickly identify what happened. The forensic capabilities on the network, in the cloud, at the endpoint, to figure out what happened so we can get back to business as usual. It's a business continuity issue. And there are many examples of doing this poorly. Uh, one example I wanted to share with you also comes from my time in New York, and uh, it's, the image is a little blurry, so I apologize for that in advance. Uh, but many of you, I'm sure, uh, if you've ever been to New York, you live and die by this card. Right? This is the metro card that lets you get on the subway and go wherever you need to go uh, in New York City, probably the best way to, uh, to get around the city. Uh, but I don't know if any of you have ever really spent time reading the back of this card. So if you look at the back of the card, there's several different variants of what you could find there, right? For example, one of them has, if you see something, say something, right? It's a, you know, if you see something wrong, say something. A citizen should always be looking out for dangerous things. Um, there's a couple other ones, you know, public service announcements. M my favorite one, though, uh, is this one, and again, apologize for the uh, blurriness, but it is subway emergency instructions. What to do if an emergency breaks out in a subway? And allow me to just go through these briefly. This, this may save your life at some point. Number one, notify train crew or police if you see someone in distress or notice unlawful or unsuspicious behavior. It's a great idea, right? That's really, you really probably should do that. Number two, do not pull the emergency cord. Now let me ask you a question. Picture yourself in a crowded subway. There is an emergency going on in that subway car. Are you either going to A, say, you know what? I remember when I got my subway card, there were some instructions on the back of what to do in a situation just like this. Let me pull out the card and see what I need to do. Or are you going to pull a giant cord that says emergency on it? You're going to pull the cord. Right? This is an example of a system that is not designed to fail well. We need to build systems where we understand and anticipate that failure sometimes happens. And that, I think, needs to be indoctrinated uh, into the way we think about security. And this last piece, the last one, is we need to be able to take action even in the face of threat intelligence that's noisy. You hear a lot about threat intelligence these days. There's a lot of threat intelligence you can go out and get. There's a lot of threat intelligence that conflicts with each other. But still, we need to make a set of choices 
based on what we know about the threat environment. Threat intelligence that you can't action is not actually very useful. And here is where I think, more than anywhere else, analytics has the potential to be kind of completely disruptive to what we do in security. And I wanted to share with you, you know, an, an experience that I've had recently that's really convicted me of this. Uh, and it's a project that some of my researchers uh, have worked on over at Symantec. We call it Project uh, Dolphin. And the way that it works is that most phishing emails that come in try and trick you to go to a site that looks like a legitimate site. This is not news. It may look like an e-commerce site you're familiar with. It may look like the Apple Store. It may look like a whole bunch of things. What if we could pull all the images of legitimate sites and then do fuzzy hashing on those images and then look for any other places on the web where images not exactly the same but similar to that exist, but the domain does not seem associated with that company. And so to do that fuzzy hashing, I want to show you an example. So on the left is a dolphin, on the right is also a dolphin, and here is the fuzzy hash of dolphin one and the fuzzy hash of dolphin two. As you can see, uh, we've got uh, some differences, but pretty close, 90, 91% match. On the left, again, is a dolphin. On the right is not a dolphin. Uh, and you can see that those hashes are, are substantially different, but there is some type of match. So we applied this kind of analytics to the billion new web requests, to new never-before-seen websites that we get that pass through our, um, our data centers every day. And we looked at things like the login portal uh, for PayPal, the login for Google, the login um, for various properties of Apple. Uh, Orange is another one. And what we found is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these sites that had a close proximity match that you could tell they were designed to look like that target. But when you looked at the genealogy of the actual domain, you knew that it was not in any way associated with that company. That's the kind of analytics and intelligence that could sit behind you clicking on that bit.ly URL and then making a decision on your behalf saying, uh-uh, I don't think you should go there. So I think we have a huge amount of potential in this space to augment what we thought of as classical defense in depth, but move it to the cloud generation. And I wanted to leave you uh, with one last thought, and I think it's a, it's a really important one in security, but it is, a, it is a thought that there are so many precedents in the security space, so many things that we just accept as ground truths that really aren't, that not a lot of research or data has gone into. And we're going to have to revisit those assumptions. So when I learned how to drive, and I grew up in the Bahamas, and I'm sure, I'm sure those of you uh, in the room um, were taught, though, very similar things. What I was taught, what it was in the driver's manual, was you should always hold the steering wheel in the 10-2 position. This is the optimal hold of the steering wheel. And a lot of math actually went into this. It's actually the optimal hold for agility. So if an unwieldy cat comes in the road, for example, if you had your hands in this position, it gives you and the cat the best chance of surviving. Right? This is what you were taught. You probably did it for the driving test and then never did it again. Right? But, but this is what you were taught. That was excellent advice at that time. Today, that is terrible advice. You should never hold the steering wheel that way. Today, what we're taught, and what our kids are taught, or our cousins, or our nieces, or nephews, is to hold the wheel in the 9-3 position. Why? 
it's because of the popularization of airbags. If you hold the steering wheel in the 10-2 position and an airbag deploys, you're going to burn an arm, break an arm, or punch yourself in the face, right? All of which are negative potential outcomes. Uh, but if you hold the wheel in the 9-3 position, it is a compromise between agility and the compensating controls that have changed in the environment. But try convincing somebody that's been taught the way at the top that that thing that was true when you learned it, which was good, that's not true anymore and that's bad now and this is the right way to do it. It's very hard to have someone unlearn something once they've already learned it. But that is exactly where we find ourselves in the security space now. A lot of the things that we learned about perimeters, how to protect them, what that means, I think have to be revisited in this new cloud generation. And I challenge everybody to think about those precedents and think about the rooting of them and ask, is there something we should be doing different given all these changes that have happened around us? I really appreciate your time. So happy to be here. So happy to be partnered with an excellent organization like Telefonica. I've just been incredibly impressed by the, the talent and the folks that are, that are here and that I've gotten to work with there. And really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for coming. Bueno, muchas gracias, Hugh. Creo que ha sido una de las presentaciones más entretenidas que hemos tenido en este auditorio. Bueno, ya solo nos quedan tres cosas. Daros las gracias por haber venido. Además, eh, tenemos un, informaros de que tenemos un cóctel aquí, según salís a, a la derecha. Y por último, recordaros que las, las, los cuestionarios que os hemos dado, algunos a lo mejor no los habéis recogido, por favor rellenarlos porque es muy importante para nosotros para tener el feedback y poder mejorar. Sin más, muchas gracias por venir. <risa>